Okay, great. All right. So um, in popular imagination, both then and now, the victory over the Persians at Plataea marked the end of the Persian War. Its place as the final battle of the war can seem deceptively obvious. Plataea witnessed the defeat of a massive Persian army that halted the offensive launched by Xerxes the year before. But the conflict with Persia did not, in fact, end at this point. The next year saw the forces of the Hellenic League ranged against the Persians and their Greek allies under Spartan hegemony, just as had the years 480 and 479. Subsequent, subsequent victories were soon to follow under Athenian hegemony. How then did a battle that manifestly did not end the Persian War, in fact, come to be given that distinction in memory? I argue that Plataea became the most recognized endpoint of the war because it served to isolate the glorious defense of Greece from its messy and chaotic aftermath. Our surviving evidence speaks to the particular role of Sparta and Athens in this process. As I hope to show today, both of these states, each for their own very different reasons, preferred the Persian War to have a cleaner end than it did in reality. I examine here four commemorations, Simonides' Plataea Elegy, the Serpent Column, an Athenian speech in Thucydides' Histories, and finally, Plato's <laughs> Menexenus, and trace how each responded to the inconvenient realities created by the ambitions of these two states after Plataea. Plataea's place as the final battle of the war was not assured from the start. Arguably, the earliest evidence for the commemoration of the battle are the fragments of Simonides' Plataea elegy. And there the battle appears in a very different light. In a fragment that narrates a battlefield prophecy, uh, this is passage one on the handout, the speaker, possibly the Spartan seer Tissamenus, notes that someone, quote, will drive, presumably the Persians, quote, out of Asia, favoring an alliance with the, quote, approval of another figure, likely a divinity. For Simonides, or rather his speaker, Plataea is not the end of the war, but rather a turning point in an ongoing war that will now be waged against the Persians in Asia. The identity of the alliance in question mentioned here is subject to debate. It is described by an adjective, which West thought to be kinane or new. But this reconstruction was based on his own belief that the alliance mentioned here was the Delian League. This is a difficult position to sustain, however. The poem otherwise betrays a clear focus on Sparta and reserves signal praise for the Spartan supreme commander, Pausanias. Certainty is impossible, but a reconstruction in which Spartan leadership remains the focus of the poem seems best. In that case, the alliance in question would not be the Delian League under Athenian hegemony, but the Hellenic League under Sparta's. Such a reconstruction would neatly fit the historical reality immediately after the Battle of Plataea. Persia remained a threat, and the Hellenic League had planned major operations in the following year. The Spartan regent, Pausanias, was dispatched at the head of a fleet that scored major victories from Cyprus to Byzantium. Nor should we imagine that these were purely mopping up operations or the fruits of local revolts. In passage two, Thucydides speaks of Pausanias subduing Cyprus and taking Byzantium by siege. The Spartan king, Leotychidas, seems to have been dispatched to Thessaly at the same time likely to overthrow Persia's Thessalian allies, and perhaps to continue on against Aeon and Dariscus, both formidable Persian strongholds in northern Greece. Here, too, significant gains were made. Herodotus, at least, felt that Leotychidas was in a strong enough position to subjugate the whole of Thessaly if he had wished. There is no question that these campaigns lacked the grandeur of the battle that Herodotus calls the finest victory known but they were nevertheless worthy successors of that victory. It is then easy to see how, in the aftermath of Plataea, the war could appear to Simonides to be very much a work in progress, whose greatest achievement, the defeat of the Persians in Asia, 
was yet to come. At almost the same time as Simonides saw in Plataea a link in an ongoing war, the list of allies inscribed on the serpent column told a different story. The monument itself was dedicated by the Greeks for the victory at Plataea, but the inscription the Spartans subsequently added makes a much broader claim. The heading appears as passage three on the handout and reads simply, quote, these fought the war. There follows a list of 31 allied states. Almost all the states that fought at Plataea are named, but so too are several that contributed only to the victory at Salamis. No state that joined the cause either at or after the Battle of Mycale is mentioned. The phrasing of the heading and the composition of the list leave the distinct impression that the war was now over and that it had ended at Plataea. This impression had serious implications for those states not included on the list, since their absence could be taken as an accusation of open or covert medism. This was no accident. Rather, I submit that it was the point. Indeed, the heading does not mention the Persians at all. The focus of the inscription is not the war, so much as the states that had, and by implication, had not, proven loyal to the cause. Plataea serves to mark the moment at which the real war ended. Other allies joined the fight subsequently, but only after the tide had turned. Those allies could and did claim to fight the Persians as well, but the Serpent Column relegates their actions to a separate, lesser sphere. The Serpent Column's inscription intersects with a different side of Spartan policy after Plataea. At the same time as Pausanias was continuing the war with Persia in the Mediterranean, Sparta was prosecuting an equally vigorous campaign against Xerxes' Greek allies on the home front. This was, of course, the principal object of Leo Tychidas's campaign in Thessaly, nor is it the only evidence for Sparta's zealous prosecution of the Medizers. In the case of Thebes, pro-Persian leaders were taken into Spartan custody and then summarily executed. Other states may have endured equally violent regime change. The small Peloponnesian town of Cariae was conquered outright by the Spartans. Individual traitors to the cause were also pursued. Herodotus records that Mardonius' seer, Agesistratus, was hunted down and killed. Ephialtes fled to Thessaly to avoid Spartan punishment. His killer, though not motivated by politics or bounty, was nevertheless honored at Sparta. Finally, the Spartans famously attempted to track down Themistocles when evidence was found, or invented, connecting him to the Persians. Even Sparta's less than stellar allies did not escape negative attention. Elis and Mantinea, whose contingents arrived too late for the Battle of Plataea, suffered discommendation and eventually exiled their own leaders. The tradition records yet grander plans for revenge, such as forced migration or exclusion from the Delphic Amphictyony. We need not credit these claims, but it remains notable that Sparta is presented as the advocate of harsher punishments in both cases. In the immediate aftermath of Plataea, the battle could be viewed either as a turning point or as an end point, depending on the nature of the war left to be fought, a war against Persia or a war against its now penitent Greek allies and sympathizers. At Sparta, however, this double view of the war did not last long. Spartan leadership in the Aegean was rejected by the Ionians, themselves former Persian allies, who may have balked at Sparta's vindictive treatment of Medizers. Pausanias, Pausanias was recalled, and greater indignity was to follow as charges of his own Medism were circulated and widely believed. Leo Tychidas too was recalled and exiled on charges of bribery. Even within the Peloponnese, Spartan hegemony was soon in question. A firm endpoint at Plataea, 
initially used to distinguish loyalty from Medism, would now additionally serve to isolate Sparta's Persian War heroics from its subsequent failures. At Athens, the situation after Plataea was different. The Athenians did not pursue Medism with any apparent zeal and are, in the tradition at least, often represented in opposition to the Spartans when they attempt to do so. Their focus tended more to an ethnic war against the Persians, which must have been particularly appealing to the Ionians, who quickly turned their allegiance from Sparta to Athens. Under Athenian leadership, the Delian League carried on what Simonides had thought to be the fated destiny of the victorious Greeks at Plataea. At first glance, then, the Athenians would seem to have every reason to emphasize the continuation of the war beyond Plataea, and some did. Thucydides, for example, let me move our hand out there, sorry. Thucydides, for example, composed an Athenian speech delivered before the Spartans on the eve of the Peloponnesian War, in which the afterlife of the Persian War plays a notable role. After a brief introduction, the ambassadors provide an extended narrative on the Persian War that focuses predominantly on Athenian heroics at Salamis. Plataea is skipped, however, as the war continues with the ongoing struggle against Persia in the Aegean. In passage four, the resulting Athenian empire emerges because the Spartans were, quote, not willing to stand fast against what remained of the barbarian force. Sparta's failure to see the war to its natural conclusion is noted again when the Athenians contextualize their current reputation by noting in passage five that, quote, if at that time you had remained through the whole affair and had become hated in your command as we have, we know well that you would have become no less offensive to the allies. Later in passage six, the Athenians make a thinly veiled reference to Sparta's short-lived command in the Aegean under Pausanias, noting that their current popularity would disappear if they should win and act as they had before, quote, when you briefly held command against the Persians. The Athenian speech contains within it an implicit rejection of Plataea as an endpoint. The war continued. Sparta was unwilling, or perhaps more accurately, unable to do what Athens ultimately did, finish the war against Persia. Other Athenian sources reflect a similar line of thinking about the end of the Persian War. But surprisingly, most of them followed the Serpent Column in concluding the war with the defeat of Xerxes' invasion. Indeed, we see indications of this periodization of the war in Aristophanes, Plato, Isocrates, Xenophon, Demosthenes, Eschines, Apollodorus, and Hyperides. To understand why, it will be helpful to take another look at the speech of Thucydides' Athenian ambassadors. There, we find an awkward fit between two very different ways of recalling the ongoing war with Persia. On the one hand, there is a clean transition between Sp the Spartan-led defense of Greece and the Athenian-led war in the Aegean. This is the implication of passages four and five. Indeed, passage five is particularly notable in this regard, since it implies that the Spartans' decision to abandon their hegemony had been made early enough to spare them any unpopularity, which was patently untrue. On the other hand, in passage six, the ambassadors seem incapable of passing up the opportunity of hinting at Sparta's short-lived and famously unpopular command under Pausanias. Thucydides' ambassadors cannot settle on a way to approach the messy transition between Spartan and Athenian hegemony. We might conclude that they are attempting and failing to spare the feelings of their Spartan audience. But that is not the tone the speech strikes otherwise. I think there is something more going on here. Let's take a look at a similarly awkward fit 
between the defense of Greece and the ongoing war in Plato's Menexodus. He uh, moves to the next series of passages here. In the dialogue's mock funerary oration, Socrates ranks the various engagements of the Persian War, with Marathon taking first place, Artemisium Salamis second, and Plataea a distant third. In fourth and final place comes the battles of the ongoing war with Persia. Plato begins this final section by setting the scene in passage seven. Quote, after this, the, the battle of Plataea, many Greek states were still with the Persians, and the king himself was reported to have another attack against the Greeks in mind. There's something wrong with the summary here. The image of a large Greek force assembled under Persian command calls to mind the situation before the mass defection of those subject allies at the Battle of Mycale, that is, before Plataea, not after it. As Plato lists the specific engagements he has in mind, he notes Eurymedon, Chemon's attack on Cyprus, and the expedition to Egypt, but skips Mycale itself. His decision is striking, striking, given that this was the battle that had stripped the Persians of their most important Greek allies. Moreover, the Athenians themselves had played such a critical role in the battle that, according to Herodotus, they had won the prize of valor. This omission is hardly an accident. Indeed, the Battle of Mycale is notably undercommemorated in the otherwise commemoration-rich Persian war tradition at Athens. Even among those Athenians who celebrated their ongoing war with Persia, there was a palpable reluctance to treat the initial phases of the campaign in the Aegean. The reasons are not hard to surmise, and they take us back to the question of hegemony. Sparta's short-lived command in the Aegean had the potential to complicate Athenian imperial ambitions in the region. It had been the Hellenic League under Spartan leadership that had first liberated the Ionians at Mycale and had continued the work in 478. During those campaigns, the powerful states of Samos, Chios, and Lesbos in addition to a host of others, join the Hellenic League. Although Thucydides tells us that the Spartans amiably accepted their ouster from the Aegean after the recall of Pausanias, there was no formal mechanism by which Sparta officially or permanently surrendered hegemony to the Athenians. When those same allies found Athenian leadership too constricting in turn, it is not unlikely that they appealed to Sparta in part on the strength of its earlier hegemony. Thucydides may preserve something of the logic here when, in passage eight, his Mytilenean ambassadors make this claim before the assembled Peloponnesians. Quote, we did not become allies of the Athenians for their subjugation of the Greeks, but allies of the Greeks for their liberation from the Persians. The later tradition may also capture something of the dangerously mixed nature of the loyalties the Athenians inherited in the Aegean. In passage nine, Plutarch records that two Ionian captains rammed Pausanias' flagship, adding that the flagrant act was done at the insistence of Aristides, who told the Ionians that, quote, trust required an act which, once done, would prevent the majority from changing back again. Although the Athenians were manifestly proud of their empire and its war with Persia, the messy reality of how Ionia had in fact been freed and by whom was not something most wanted to recall. The Battle of Plataea came to be the most recognized endpoint of the Persian War, not because it ended that conflict, it didn't, but because such an ending advanced the hegemonic ambitions of Sparta and Athens. Both had a vested interest in giving the Persian War the sharp break it lacked in reality. Almost from the start, Sparta's policy against the Medizers demanded a moment at which the true test of loyalty, the real war, had ended. The subsequent failure of its hegemony in the Aegean 
could have only reinforced the need to isolate the grand heroics of Greece's defense from what followed. Sparta needed a full stop. The Athenians could accept a seizure, a pause that created the illusion of two discrete phases of the war, the defense of Greece under nominal Spartan hegemony and the ongoing war under theirs. Nevertheless, most of our Athenian sources simply opted to end the Persian War with the defeat of Xerxes' invasion and treated the growth of empire as a distinct period. In the Battle of Plataea, both Sparta and Athens found a convenient way to obscure the inconvenient realities that followed. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much. So interesting. And I think you made a good case for talking about how people have different priorities in how these things are done. And I have thoughts myself, but let me open it to the group, perhaps. Uh, I would say, yes, Shane, you are quick there. Uh, I, noticed Dave, I noticed David put his hand up and I didn't- I accidentally, I up. think I was trying to do something and <laughs> that was that totally an accident. It's rather unfair to ask yourself a question. I know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like, that was fantastic. That was great. I really, really enjoyed that. But uh, why wouldn't I? You're, I've enjoyed your, your book completely. Thank you. Um, I was going to say, I had a couple of just off the cuff thoughts, um, but also one sort of question. Uh, so something that might be grist to your mill when you're thinking about the serpent column and that idea of making Plataea something is what happens with the tombs, as Herodotus describes, that, that, that there's contestation over them. And people come along and they start erecting cenotaphs because Patea is the place where you have to be. So that shows some, so, and, and those, those cenotaphs seem to be destroyed over time. I'll mention mm -hmm. that later. But so there might be something there for you. The other thing is to think about what the Spartans and the Athenians actually had. Athens had Marathon, Athens had Salamis. Sparta had a no-show and a defeat. That was, so, so Patea was something they needed, you know? Mm -hmm. They really had to have that big victory a big end point. We turned up, we did it, we came out from behind the wall and boom, it's done. Yeah. And then they sort of drop the mic and go back to the Peloponnese. <laughs> um, the other thing I was thinking about was, and this, this is the only question here really, is whether or not the destruction of Patea is important. Does that have any impact on this, that Patea is a site and, you know, they have these deep connections with Athens. I think Hans talked about it very briefly yesterday, 519 and then in, in 479 they symbolically give themselves over and then they're destroyed by the Thebans and the Spartans so does that factor into this model you're creating in any way that that desolate wasteland of freedom that's there yeah it's, it's so hard to think of the the memory of the battle or the, the without the the history of the place right I mean it, especially I'm, I'm 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 flashing forward to Alexander the Great who's who's doing a lot of that work and thinking about the city through that lens in a lot of ways when he's thinking about the the commemoration of that battle um for the Spartan examples, obviously they would predate. So presumably Sparta would have, have made its decision to, to really insist on something like a full stop um, earlier. The Athenian examples are, are significantly later, mm. right? And I, I, I tried this in a different project to try to trace out if we could see an evolutionary progression in the way the Athenians periodized the war. I think they're, I think never sort of in, 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 in so many words, but in passing, I think there's been a tendency to imagine that well, the Athenians were much more open to an ongoing war initially, and then only later when the Delian League kind of soured as, as, a, as a sort of a raw, raw institution, did they back away and start to think of the war as this smaller entity. Um, and I, I just couldn't find the evidence for it. I mean, partially, this is, this is an issue of amount. We only have four pieces of evidence that the Athenians ever thought of the war as being a longer entity, that is one that combined all the way to the Peace of Callias. But the four pieces are the, the Athenian speech, the Menexenus, possibly Demosthenes' funerary oration, uh, and a very important fourth one that is completely slipping my mind right now. But even with those pieces alone, we're, we're looking at pieces that are attempting to either mock, to represent popular notions of the Athenian past. And so even with a handful, we have it, a good indication that it would have been something that was, that was out and about. The problem is with just those four, it's hard to trace yeah. Time. And if two of them are funeral orations, you might be dealing with a sort of genre theme. Right. But then we turn to Lysias where we, we don't get it. Mm. Right. So yeah. Lysias is Lysias too. We, it's, it's, a, it's a sharp, it's a sharp break at Plataea. And so certainly, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a little bit up in the air there is, is, is Thucydides giving us the traditional old school sort of funeral oration. And then, you know, we've got, um, we've got Lysias coming in 
giving us kind of the newer version that doesn't have the longer war. But then, of course, Menexenus pretending to be by Aspasia, lurching back to that fifth century tradition. Yeah, that's a it's it's a complicated beehive. <laughs> I like that bit where you brought up Thucydides 176 and this sort of, you know, yeah, if you had kept on, then you would also have the next. It brings us into this all this wonderful counterfactual history that, you know, Mard Mardonius survived the yeah. on. Who knows where it would have gone? Anyway, thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Lynn, you had a question as well. Just a little, I, I, I've never really looked into this, but um, I mean, people have, have restored the heading of the serpent column inscription in different ways, haven't they? And, and sometimes people want the word meads to be in there. Um, I, I have absolutely no um, sort of view on <laughs> the epigraphical propriety of these because I've never looked at it. But actually, in, I mean, in a sense, in your terms, um, serpent column as a, as a kind of um, public marker about who were, who, were, who were Medizers and who weren't, um, actually naming the enemy at the top would, I suppose, have, have underlined the point, but possibly it's not, I mean, necessary to make the point. I mean, I, yeah, I, it just passed my mind that you might consider whether there is a case for a reading that um, that names the Medes. So that you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, your memory is serving you perfectly. There is a, a reading that would restore the word uh, Maidon. Um, it's, it's the minority reading though. Um, generally, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's been proposed certainly, but most most have, have gone, and, and I can't claim to be much of an epigrapher, mm -hmm. but the, the arguments at least for a gifted amateur seem, seem fairly persuasive mm -hmm. that we shouldn't restore mm -hmm. it there. Um, for me, it's presence or absence is not entirely critical. There's another way we could kind of poke at that argument to say that, well, you actually don't have defeated enemies named all that much at Delphi. Um, this has been pointed out a little bit of a, 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 a tradition difference between Olympia and Delphi when we have these things there. Um, but the Athenians, of course, put the Medes by name on the sort of uh, statue group right beside their treasury. So there already was at least some kind of tradition that you could at least name the Persians, if not maybe fellow Greeks there. Yeah. So I was reading that a little bit as a significant piece, but there is some uncertainty. So that's that's absolutely fair. Yeah. Absolutely fair yeah. there. Oh, I agree. It's probably not critical from your point of view. Yeah. And Scarlet Kingsley, your question was up next. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that paper. It was wonderful. Thank you. I, I want to know now uh, where does you know Herodotus fit in this, and why is it that his histories end, you know, not at Plataea where it might have, but he goes on to um, Mycale, and then after that into Sestos, and then finally with the return maybe to the beginning with Cyrus, but we don't need to get into that. But but certainly Sestos, and this is something that Diodorus Siculus also ends, you know, ta me dika with. He goes up until. Mm -hmm. um, Cestus. So I find that interesting. There's very few historians. The only one I found who actually ends with Plataea is a very shadowy figure named Aristodemus, who mm -hmm. probably is writing in the second century AD. And his, um, not his histories, but his section on the Persian Wars actually do conclude with Plataea. So I wonder why is it that we're getting so many historians who are going on? And I'm also wondering why it wouldn't serve Athens' interests in the fifth century to have the narrative go on. Um, Particularly because if you if you if you interpret the the Delian League and its origins as as this continuation of the Persian Wars, then you're really uh, I think giving extra oomph to the to the evolution of the empire by saying that really the Persian Wars didn't end and Athens had to keep fighting. Um, and and I think there's a passage at nine one oh six where Herodotus talks about this mini kind of battle with the with the Peloponnesians um, where they're talking um, with the Athenians about what to do with Ionia and the Peloponnesians say we should move them into all the Medizers territory and Her and Herodotus's Athenians say no um, even though the Peloponnesians say otherwise we'll have an eternal garrison you know he says this is going to last forever the, and the Athenians say no we're these are our you know our, our colonies we can't do that um, so it sort of embeds this future um, garrison forever that, 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 that legitimates Athens' presence in the region. So I'm wondering, why do we need Athens to want Plataea to be the end? Yeah, there's, uh, I, I, I'm almost afraid I'm not going to do justice to so many good questions uh, wrapped up in there. Um, the historians are interesting, right? That is to say, I mean, your, your sort of initial point that Herodotus doesn't do this, he goes down to Cestus. 
And in a way, Thucydides does something very similar. He'll he'll continue what he's going to self-describe in the, I think it's the second, the second introduction to the Pentagon to Atiyah. He's going to stop his Tomatica and say, hey, you know, everyone's gone up to the end of Tomatica and no one's really gone after that. That narrative point is the transfer of command, that is the rejection of Pausanias. And so um, it, it shouldn't really surprise us in a way that both of our historians are, are sort of thumbing their nose to what, if we read sort of more broadly, seems to be the popular tradition, which which thinks of less subtle, more, more, more clean endings like Plataea, the big battle. Whereas our historians are like, well, not really. Um, for Herodotus in particular, and I, I've, I've argued this, or at least have tried to, um, I think you can find threads to a, to a distinctly, and this shouldn't surprise given where Herodotus is from, but distinctly Ionian perspective to the periodization of the war. The war really begins when Croesus subdues Ionia, and it really ends when Ionia gets liberated. Um, and I think for him particularly, moving the battle over to Sestos and Mike Halley is really important. I mean, not just as a, as a narrative function, but as a, as a kind of a statement. This is where the war was happening. Um, and if we, if we sort of, depending on how far we want to press Diodorus using Ephorus and following him, it's something that maybe Ephorus was interested in as well. If we compare Mike Halley and Herodotus and Mike Halley and Diodorus, the Ionians are, I mean, the Ionians are pretty active in Herodotus's version of Mycali. They're even more active in Diodorus's version of Mycali. They're critical to the victory of that battle. And so you can see these two Ionians, broadly speaking, kind of playing that, that periodization game. The other question about the Athenians, I think, gets to the, the heart of this, right? I mean, it was something that really did surprise me when I first started looking into this. I mean, my assumption generically was that they were going to be loud and proud that the Persian War went on, the optics of it do a lot of amazingly good things for them in that it highlights Sparta's failure. Um, but we just don't see it as often as, as, as I was really hoping to, either in a monumental context. I mean, we do get obviously monuments for Eurymedon and Cyprus and some of these others. And of course we have Samian monuments for Egypt. And so it's not like there's a, there's a kind of a, you know, for both, don't, don't do it, you know, like a, an amnesia over it. But the intimate connection between the defense of Greece and that ongoing war is something that the Athenians, at least in the surviving sources, don't do nearly as much as one would imagine. And that's really what I'm trying to think of, that it's, it's really quite messy. I actually did a quick look a few days ago to see some Athenian narratives about the beginnings of the Athenian Empire. Um, you know, uh, the orators and stuff like this, not the historians, but try to get down into kind of popular imagination. And I was shocked to see how rarely Pausanias shows up. I kind of also expected them to throw Pausanias under the bus at literally every occasion they could. And they don't. They tend not to mention him at all. Right. So there, I'm, I'm kind of playing around with this reluctance of that, that 478 to 477. The Athenians don't love 79 to 77. They don't love what's going on there. Somehow they, they love it going forward and Kimon's in charge and they're winning these big victories. But acknowledging how much their empire is founded on Spartan efforts and Spartan leadership, I, that's my kind of going guess right now that they're really uncomfortable with that. Okay, thank you. No, that answered my question. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>